Good morning, everyone. I warmly welcome you to this, our Sunday morning service, 14th April, 2024. Um, I say a special welcome to everyone in the sanctuary with us today. It's a lovely morning outside, and it's a great time and place to be here. And for those of us joining online, I say a special welcome to you, or maybe even if you're watching the recording of this service later. I met a special lady yesterday and also her son. Her name is Maxine and her son is Roshane. And they told me they love watching our service um, every Sunday morning, especially um, the children's time. They look forward to that. So I told her, well, I happen to be um, leading tomorrow, so I'll say a special hello and welcome. So Maxine and Roshane, special welcome to you. Um, in our church family, we like to acknowledge celebrations, and I think we have two birthdays on our list this week. I see Amelia Hines Burgess. Did I pronounce that right, Clive? That's Clive's granddaughter. Any others? Did you celebrate a birthday last week or in the coming week that we don't have on our list? I know we had one more that I saw through email, that's April. I will um, just leave that there. April is the counselor at the Bethesda Counseling Center. Anyone else? No birthdays, anniversaries? Do we have, no? Nobody got married in April? No? No, no? Okay. Well, let's have a happy birthday. Oh, well, there you go. Somebody got married in April. <laughs> we'll sing happy birthday for little Amelia and also for April. As we um, prepare our hearts to fellowship and to focus on God, I invite you to join me in prayer. Let us pray. All heavens declares the glory of the risen Lord. We come to this place and time today to worship our risen Lord and to fellowship with each other. Thank you for the freedom to worship you without persecution. We pray that you will calm our busy minds and bring peace to our hearts as we focus on you now. Be with each person participating in today's service, particularly our preacher and guest speaker. We pray that our time together will uplift and encourage us, but above all, May your name be glorified and praised. Amen. I invite you to stand as we read responsively our call to worship, which will flow straight into our songs of praise. The call to worship is going to be on the overheads. We are witnesses. We are witnesses of God's love. We are witnesses to everyone we encounter, little children like us, sisters and brothers in God's family. Amen. Our songs of praise are for in building a people of power, followed by colors of day.
prepared something for children's time today. But I think I'll save it for um, another week. I will just give the children the shortened version of my message, which was, um, it was to do with prayer and about praying and about how prayers can be long or short. Um, you can close your eyes, you can open your eyes. It's just all about talking to God. And before the children leave for Sunday school, um, Miss Nadine's class, for those of you in Miss Nadine's class, um, she's not here today, but she's left some work for you to do. And we're also having a special presentation, a special mission moment. So the children uh, that attend Miss Nadine's class, you can stay on for that. And after the mission presentation, you can go on upstairs and start your worksheets. And um, Miss Valerie's class, the students in Miss Valerie's class, um, you can go on after this prayer. So I invite us now to join in prayer for our children. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for looking after us, providing for all our needs and for being our friend. We thank you for the joy of Sunday school and for our teachers who prepare every week. Bless all the children in our congregation, those present and not, with good health, safety, and peace. Amen. So Miss Valerie's class, if you're on Miss Valerie's class, you can head up on to Sunday school. And uh, Miss Nadine's class, um, you can leave after the mission presentation. As the children are going up to Sunday school, we'll sit and sing the prayer chorus, Father, we adore you. cry with the psalmist. I will call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I will call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So many times we come to you with the list of things we want, asking for your intervention and direction. 
This morning, we take some time to acknowledge how great and wonderful you are to us and how good it is for us to shower you with our praises. We give praise for your goodness and wonderful work in us. We also offer up our prayers of thanksgiving for the many times you continue to show up for us and provide for all our needs. Even when we don't know what is good for us, you supply what we need in the right amount and in the right time. Thank you, Lord. We reflect on the past week and think of the many blessings you continue to lavish upon us each day, most of which we take for granted. Thank you. At this time, we silently confess our sins to you. Have mercy on us, O Lord, and forgive us. Give us the courage and humility to forgive others and extend grace as you've taught us to do by your example. Strengthen our minds against temptation and restore us to your salvation. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our words of assurance comes from Ephesians 2 verses 4 and 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Amen. Our announcements will be um, shown on the overheads. I think we have a few. Next week, Sunday, is fellowship breakfast. This, I should be seeing lots of smiles from everyone because we all get excited when it's breakfast after church. Um, so next week, I know we're going to have a full house. Um, you don't have to bring a dish to stay back and worship with us, and it's also a good opportunity to invite someone to join, to join us uh, in worship. So next week, we're going to have fellowship breakfast after church. Um, the Forget Me Not ministry, I think we've announced this um, the last few weeks as well. Please see Sheila or Nadine if you are interested. Forget Me Not is a way to keep connected with those in our church family who we don't very often see or who might be sick, who might be celebrating um, something. So um, if you would like to be involved, please see Sheila or Nadine. Bible study resumes on the 24th, so not this Wednesday, the following Wednesday. Um, this is for the online Zoom Bible study. We're going to be studying the Psalms, light reading. So um, if you've not joined us on Zoom before, I would encourage you maybe just log in. You don't have to participate. You can just listen in the background. There's always some good conversation happening there. Um, the link and details for the Bible study is usually in the weekly email. We also have an in-person Bible study that happens right here in the sanctuary every second and fourth Tuesday. Um, the topic is on the series, The Chosen, and I see a big stamp there, none this week, so the next one is going to happen on the 23rd. Um, that's in person here at 10 a.m. Um, next week, everyone's invited to an evening of music out at the John Gray Church in West Bay. It starts at 6.30 p.m., and I'm happy to say our own little choir is performing, so please make every effort to attend. It's going to be um, a lovely evening of music with different people performing. Worship leader training session for all of you who are so ready to come up here and lead worship or you're thinking about it. Um, there's going to be a training on the 27th of April from 9 to 12. I believe this is out in Prospect. Spots. Um, yeah, the details are listed there. And if you are interested, 
um, and getting signed up, you can reply to that weekly email. So that's on the 27th. Um, very important, the prayer list in our church. Uh, we continue to pray for Karma Aston, that's Emily's mom, Miss Malva Hurlston, Miss Olive Bush. I believe Miss Olive is still in hospital? No? Oh, she was discharged, so thankful for that, but we're still keeping her in prayer. Uh, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but if there's anyone in our congregation or perhaps you're watching online at home and you would like, you know, prayer or you want the church to pray for you, um, please send an email or reach out to an elder and we can add you to the prayer list. If you don't want it to be announced um, publicly in church, uh, we can also pray for you privately. Is that it for announcements? All right. Go through that quickly. Now, many of you may have noticed that Reverend Myers is not sitting next to me. Um, we do have three special guests with us this morning. For those of you who are at home and can't see, they are seated in front. Um, I have Mr. Chuck visiting, and we have two special guests with us. And before I say anything wrong, I'm going to read from my page so I don't misrepresent anyone. First of all, we have uh, Mr. Jude Vilma, who's a pastor. Chuck told me I don't need to read anything on this page, and I can just say he's from the Bahamas and he likes to eat conch. <laughs> <laughs> and his lovely wife, uh, Mrs. Kitro Vilma. And Jude, now I'm going to read from my script. <laughs> Jude was born in Nassau, Bahamas, and grew up on the island of Abaco. In 2013, he graduated with a Bachelor of Secondary Education from the University of the Bahamas. After four years of teaching in public educational system in the Bahamas, Jude answered a call to full-time ministry. He served with a local youth mission organization in Nassau. Um, as the associate youth coordinator for three years where he discipled high school and college students. Concurrently, he serves as a pastoral intern and deacon at his home church, St. Andrew's Presbyterian. In May 2023, Jude graduated with a Master of Divinity at Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando, Florida. He's a full-time pastoral resident at River City Church, DeBarry, Florida. He's presently going through the ordination process and a call to full-time pastoral ministry with the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. He has been married to his beautiful wife, Keitra, for four years. They reside in Florida and will return to the Bahamas this summer where he will serve as an associate pastor in their home church in Nassau. So that's Jude, and now we move on to his lovely wife, Miss Keitra Vilma. Keitra is the Regional Director, Northern Caribbean, with Operation Mobilization Caribbean. After serving part-time as Country Director for the Bahamas for four years, in 2020, she answered the call to serve full-time with Operation Mobilization. OM, as it's referred to, was established in 1957 as an international mission organization serving over 140 countries. Uh, one of the ministries that they do is the Logos um, Bookship. I don't know if many of you uh, know about the Logos. And I believe um, Chip with the um, ventriloquist um, is also part of OM and Chip has visited with us a few times as well with his um, junior, his companion. Keitra specifically serves the local church in Bermuda, Cayman Islands, Turks and Caicos, and the Bahamas. She worked in the private banking sector for 12 years before joining OM full-time. She's been married to Jude since 2019, and she loves mentoring, reading, watching science fiction or fantasy movies. Keitra is also a part-time student pursuing her Master of Arts Theological Studies at the Reformed Theological Seminary. So I'm going to invite Keitra to come up now and she's going to give us a brief presentation on 
her work at OAM. Good morning and thank you so much, Sarah. Yes, good morning, South Sound United Church. All right. It is such a blessing to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And um, it has just been um, just wonderful worshiping with you already. And uh, as the bio said, as Sarah read, I serve now full time with OM. And uh, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. So I'm here, I'm going to share a little bit about OM, but I'm also going to share a bit more about my journey just for a few minutes because God uses ordinary, regular people to do his work in amazing, extraordinary ways. And we'll be surprised how he would use us. So as mentioned before, OM was started in 1957 and it started with a short-term mission trip to Mexico. And now we see many years later, it's about 4,000 missionaries serving in over, now over 150 countries. We are about 120 nationalities. I think uh, Cayman has more than 120 nationalities. So that is even something even more special, visiting here in Cayman. And our heartbeat is that we want to see churches planted around the world, especially and primarily amongst the least rich. And there are about 17,000 people groups around the world, but there are about 7,000, a little over 7,000 people groups that we consider unreached, that we consider least reached, and uh, that makes up about over 3 billion people around the world. And what is even more interesting, just being here in Cayman, is that we see the nations actually here. Um, in the country where I'm from, the Bahamas, we see some nations um, in our population and in the cruise ship, but this is a very unique opportunity that Cayman has. And so, as I um, said, I've been serving now uh, full-time since 2020, but my story didn't just start in 2020 or 2016 when I started part-time. I actually was a little girl in a church just a little bigger than this when I used to see missionaries from serving locally in the Bahamas, in Haiti, in India, sharing their testimonies. And I was always interested in learning more about serving cross-culturally. And it wasn't until I was a teenager I actually stood up at an altar call and I said, you know what, I want to serve in missions. And you know what, I was about 13, 14, but I eventually forgot about it. I went off to college, <laughs> if I'm being honest, I went off to college, graduated from Dalhousie University in Canada, came home, and I was recruited by UBS. And so I worked in the graduate training program in UBS, and I was on track to not only being a manager, but I was very career-driven, very career-oriented, and still a believer, still walking as close as I can, um, but I was sort of church, not really church. I had my home church that I grew up in, but by the time I graduated from college, I wanted to, to join another church. So I was seeking different churches. So in 2008, I started at UBS. I've actually been to Cayman. I was a part of our business content, continuity team. So I visited a few times if a hurricane was coming to the Bahamas. They would fly some of us over. And um, I just loved the career I was in. And at that time, though, I started visiting a church. And when I started going to this church, I joined a small group. And everything at the small group, we talked about the kazone. What is the vision that God has for your life? And everything kept pointing towards evangelism and missions. That's because anytime I meet anyone, I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about what um, God has done, not only in my life, but I want to understand and connect with people and point them to Christ. So I was like, okay, God, how am I going to do this now? I want to go into missions, but I am just starting at uh, my career. So what I ended up doing was I went on a short-term missions trip, and I went to missions conference in Italy with OM. And it was during that time, after that missions conference, I served in Albania and served the gypsy kids. And served the little kids, eight, nine, ten years old. They were the professional beggars. They were the money makers for their family. 
And it wasn't until we did, we did kids ministry with them in the morning, but it wasn't until in the evening, one evening during our time there, we went with a local long-term missionary and I shared my testimony. And one of the parents, they asked me to come because she used to do palm readings and different tea leaf readings, all of these different readings. And they wanted me to encourage her in the Lord. But I actually ended up sharing my testimony with her. And she said, I asked her, do you want to know more about Jesus? And she said, yes. I do want to know more about this, about this Jesus. Uh, we had a translator, and uh, she heard the gospel, and she said, I want to be a follower of Christ. So I was like, God, you can use me. I, can't, I went up. Like I said, I grew up in church, but I did not know, you know all the Bible verses. I didn't know all of the cool Christian lingos. You know, I just did not feel equipped, but I just wanted to be faithful and just wanted to take the necessary steps that I know God was leading me to. So when I came back, I was like, man, I wish I could leave. And I was like, no, I still didn't, I, I still wasn't ready to leave the bank yet. And so I ended up taking every vacation. I had about four weeks vacation. I would take every vacation and I would not only go, but I started taking people with me from the Bahamas. Whoever was residing, if you want to go on a mission, we're going to go wherever the Lord calls us, with YWAM, with OM, and just around the world. But mainly we did a lot of ministry in Europe ministering to local church, ministering with local churches and to the local people or to the immigrant communities. And so during my first trip, I met this guy. I didn't, I have a dad, but he, you know, you can have a father, but he's not really a fatherly figure. So God always has a way of connecting you with people. And on my first mission trip with OM, I met this guy named Michael. And he ended up becoming a bit like a dad. Even when I met Jude, I told him, I said, um, I met a guy, Michael. He was from the UK, I mean, from Canada, but living in South Africa. And so we would keep in touch. And he would sort of mentor me. And I remembered at this point, I was at UBS. A great opportunity came up uh, to, be a, uh, to be the only portfolio manager at Bank C's, as a bank based in Geneva, but they had a branch in Nassau. And I said, let me take advantage of that opportunity. And I was working there. I was taking people on trips. I was given the missions. I was supporting tons of missionaries. I was single. I was making a lot of money, more than the average Bahamian. And you know, I was just like, this is, this is the good life. This is good. And God, you are good. And he, he is good. And so what happened was, I, a few years later, I saw Mike. He was a full-time missionary with OM. We went to this conference, and I said, Mike, I have some great news for you. I said, Mike, what I did, um, these are all of the things I've been doing recently. And then I said, I don't know if any of you have been to the Bahamas. There's this area called Lightford Key, and the world's richest lives there, live there. I didn't live there, but I purchased some property by myself next door in Serenity. And I said, Mike, I'm doing all of this, and now I just purchased some property. I'm going to build my house. I'm going to pay off this mortgage, and in about 10 to 20 years, then I'll become a full-time missionary. And he, he just looked at me, you know. He just looked, he listened, and he quietly said, when I was done with all of my plans, he said, Keetra, you're an error. And I was like, oh, okay. And I didn't even know what to say after that. Like, the conversation just got awkward, stopped. He, and he called me Ketra, Ketra. He lived in South Africa so long. And I said, OK, Mike. So we ended the conversation. And um, I came home, felt some type of way. But I started, I said, you know what? I have given Mike this permission to speak into my life. And you might have those persons in your life. And I said, let me take a step back and just see what all is really happening. And I took a step back, and I prayed, and it took me months. But I realized that I was in a lot of student debt. Even though I was managing a lot of money, I was not managing my own money. He didn't know all of those details. He just knew the nice parts. So I said, I took a step back. I decided to reset my entire finances. And after praying, I ended up selling the property in Serenity. I lived in a home out west. I, I moved out. And I said, let me just reset, and let me step back. Let me get financially healthy and then I'll go and see whatever God has next. So I sold basically everything and just ended up renting a place in town after that I met Jude. But I just wanted to share that because after I did all of that, I said, okay, God, I am going to whatever you said, I'm gonna just go ahead and I just, I'm gonna say yes to whatever happens. So I paid off my student loan, 
caught up with Dave Ramsey, we know about Dave Ramsey, and really started to do really well. But it was right when I paid off my loan, it was about a week later, I was part-time with OM, a week later, my boss had no clue. I was really embarrassed about my student loan, actually. He sends me this email, Ketra, we have this new uh, post as regional director for the Northern Caribbean. You'll be coming alongside churches and people and mobilizing them into missions. And are you interested? And I said, you know what, I have been praying about this. At this point, I'd met Jude. We were, you know, starting to, to, to date. And I said, you know what, God, I made this commitment that if this opportunity came up again, I would say yes, and in the right type of space as well. And I said yes. So in 2020, I came full time. I, I raised support, so it took me about a year. So I would go to the bank, and every evening, I would meet with persons who want to uh, come on and join financially. So I just wanted to share that story with you. I don't know where you are right now in your life, um, where you are in your journey. I loved working in the bank. I really have not much complaints um, in the workplace as a Christian. What was unique was uh, management always asked me. If they had a little issue, they would say, okay, let's see what Ke the Christian or let's see what Keetra has to say about it. And I wasn't, I was just there, just there to listen and to help guide. So I really loved banking. But God called me, an ordinary Bahamian gal, to go and to come alongside to encourage persons into missions. So I just wanted to just leave that with you, that wherever you are, just be faithful to where God is calling you. If, you, someone has put, if God has put someone in your path about mentoring, who's to mentor you or somebody, just listen to them, pray about it, but just be faithful to where God is calling you. And so as I close, um, because this is not the sermon, <laughs> this is not the sermon, in Acts 1.8, um, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And even uh, South Sound United Church, when we hear uh, Jesus' command, a great commission, when we hear that, we are thinking, okay, I need to do my Jerusalem first and then the ends of the earth. But I wanted to encourage you, it's concurrent. If God has called you to serve, serve faithfully. And I think everyone should serve faithfully locally. But there might be some of you that want to actually go out. That's my timer. That might want to go out. That might want to financially support. That want to just come alongside. So it's concurrent. So serve faithfully in your Jerusalem. But to the ends of the earth, I found every 10 to 15 people, there's someone who wants to go and serve long term. I meet many who wants to go short term. So we have tons of short-term opportunities. I'm around for about five minutes. We have a mission trip to Guyana, mission trip to London um, in September. We have tons of long-term and dozens of short-term mission trips. And I just wanted to encourage you. I'm around. I'm happy to connect. We can talk afterwards. But just be faithful to wherever God is calling you. And all of this, God can use use South Sound in a mighty way in all facets of missions and being his witness as we had had that in our call to worship this morning. We can be his witnesses in our Jerusalem here in Cayman amongst the amazing number of nationalities and even to the ends of the earth. So please connect with me. Um, I love to catch up. I love to talk. And I am very grateful. I, I do. <laughs> I won't talk to, for you too, to, to you too long today because we have to go to Elmsley. But, you know, I love to connect. So um, just wanted to share my story, just wanted to give you a little encouragement, and God uses ordinary people for extra, his extraordinary purposes. So be encouraged, and see you after church, and see you hopefully when I come back to Cayman. Okay, God bless you, and thank you again. Thank you, Keitra. You've certainly given us so much to think about, but uh, most appreciative for that challenge. And I'll just say this now in case I forget to say it after the service. I know they're moving on to Emsley, but I have her email address. So if you would like to connect with her, you can send me an email or speak to me after and I can connect you with uh, Keitra. Uh, um, scripture reading today comes from Exodus. And we're going to read together because we did not have anyone sign up to read. And I know exactly at which point um, everybody's going to go soft when we're reading together. But 
that's all I'll say. So it's going to come up on the overheads, and we're going to read together. Exodus 30, verses 1 to 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bethlehem, son of Uriah, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed Ophelia, son of Asmai, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything I have commanded you. The tent of meeting, the ark of the covenant law, with its only cover upon it, and all the other furnishings of the tent, the table and its articles, the pure gold lampstand, and all its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering, and all its utensils, the basin with its sand, and also the woven garments, both the sacred garments for Aaron, the priests, and the garments for his sons when they serve as priests, and the anointing oil and fragrant incense for the holy place. They are to make them just as I commanded you. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. God. Amen. We'll remain seated as we sing our song of preparation, and then I'll invite uh, Pastor Jude to bring us a message. We're going to sing Rain in Me. Good morning. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here with you, worshiping you today, and to be in the Cayman Islands once again. And good job pronouncing those words, right? <laughs> Oholiab, Bezalel, Ahisamak. Good job with those Hebrew words. And so before I begin, let us bow our heads and go before a throne of grace. O oh Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, your word declares that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The word also says that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, so that the man and woman of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. And so, Lord, as we come to your word, may you challenge us, may you convict us, may you encourage us, to do every good work according to what you have commanded us for your glory alone. So speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'm sure everyone has had a time in your life when you ask the question, what is your vocation or what kind of ministry God is calling you to do or how best can you use your gift? Perhaps you are asking those questions right now. Certainly these are important questions to consider and to take seriously, but we must realize that our individual stories are part of something much bigger. It is part of God's big story of how God is calling a people to himself. And in Exodus 31, we get a picture of God's work in the world and how he uses ordinary people to work out his extraordinary purposes in this world. Now, if we were to go back to Exodus 25, the Lord said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. And now we come to some final instructions regarding this building project. The Lord is not simply satisfied with how the tabernacle is to be built. He is concerned with who is going to be the builders, and he will provide what they need to accomplish his work. And this building project is complex. And because of sin, we are unable to do as the Lord commands. We need the right people and God's spirit, and we need to grasp the big picture. And so our main idea this morning is that the Lord sovereignly calls and equips his people by his Holy Spirit to accomplish his work according to his command and for his glory alone. And there are three things I want us to look at this morning in our passage. Number one, the Lord calls his people. Number two, the Lord equips his people for his work. And number three, the Lord calling and equipping requires obedience. The Lord calls his people. The Lord equips his people for his work. And the Lord's calling and equipping requires obedience. So first, Lord calls his people. And it's common people. It's ordinary people that he calls. And the passage begins with this typical introductory statement that runs through the whole section dealing with the tabernacle. And it says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, so from the very beginning, we see that it is the Lord's instructions. It's the Lord who is saying these things to Moses. And then he says in verse one, I mean, verse two, see, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Ur of the tribe of Judah. So from the beginning of our passage, again, we see that it is God's initiative and his plan is coming to pass, especially if we look at the imperative verb C. And it carries the force of a direct command to Moses to observe what the Lord God is already doing. In fact, one can say that the Lord God is the designer. He is the architect. He is the primary builder. And he is the one who is inviting his people to participate in his work. And the Lord is, is calling by name. And to call by name means he, that he's calling that person into his service to accomplish his will. And that person is Bezalel. And his name literally means in the shadow of God, which reflects the idea of being under God's divine care and protection. Now, if we go back down to Verse 6, the Lord says, And behold, I have appointed with him a Aholiab, which means the father is my tent, and he is the son of Ahesamach of the tribe of Dan. And with him he gives able men to assist. So even as God specifically called Aaron and Moses to a particular work, he specifically called these men to serve as his craftsmen for his building project. Bezalel would be the, the master craftsman 
and Jehoiada would be the chief assistant. And these men were not chosen by a jury of fellow craftsmen, but they were called by the sovereign and electing choice of God. They were God's personal choice for this project, and their calling was sacred because the names that they were given pointed to God. But you can say that there is probably nothing special about these men. There was some mention about the family of origin, the tribe that they came from, but we don't see these men appear anywhere else in Scripture. They were just ordinary people. So what could be the significance of Bezalel and Aholiab? And there were probably other craftsmen that were needed for this building project. And the Lord chose by name these craftsmen to head this project. And so brothers and sisters, this underscores that their importance, because very few individuals are named specifically. And these men were also to teach and lead other men as well. And we know nothing about them. They were simply called to serve in God's building project. And so how does this translate for us today? Well, many of us have not probably heard God call us audibly by name, like Bezalel and Aholiab, to build a tabernacle. But as Christians, we all have a calling in our lives. Not just a calling to salvation, as God has called us from darkness and to his marvelous light, that we were once a people far off, but he has brought us near by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But to be called is, by God is to be chosen for a specific ministry or service. In the past few weeks, I've been preparing for ordination exams. But before I started to take these exams, there were a bunch of, of questions I had to answer. There were a bunch of forms I had to fill out concerning my background my education, statements of faith, what I believe about this or that, my goals and leadership styles, and so on. And one of the questions I would ask was, share about your sense of call to ministry. And as a young boy growing up in a small island of immigrant parents, I don't think there was anything special about me and I cannot pinpoint a time when I knew specifically that God was calling me into full-time ministry. But as I serve alongside others and I grew in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, I knew I wanted to do more. And during my time in college and working in the public school system in the Bahamas, I spent a lot of time serving and leading and connecting with others. And it is then that God stirred within my heart the desire to be in full-time ministry. And also there were friends and family members and colleagues and mentors and even students who I taught that affirmed my call to ministry. And a call to pastoral ministry is not an easy calling, but it is a great privilege. And I know that God is preparing me for what he has prepared for me. So every Christian has a calling in his and her life. It doesn't have to be full-time ministry. But the point is, it doesn't matter your background, your family of origin, your race, your past, or your age or stage in life. He calls whom he wills for his own purposes. And the question is, will you answer when he calls? Will you say, here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, I am your servant. For the Lord who calls us by name has a special purpose for us, which he has prepared beforehand that we might walk in it. And we must realize also that God calls ordinary people like you and I to take part in his extraordinary purposes. Whether you're in construction, working, in the tourism sector, working in banking, landscaping, serving in church, or a homemaker, or even a student, 
see that your calling is from the Lord to accomplish his work in this world. So what is the Lord's calling to you today? And many times we know what God is calling us to do. But yet we have doubt. We are fearful. We feel like we're not ready to pursue it. We have to do such and such a thing before we can go such and such a place. I know I felt like I was not equipped. I was not ready. So what do we need? And so in our passage, these craftsmen were not just called to do this special work. They were also gifted and equipped by his Holy Spirit. So our second point is the Lord equips those whom he calls. And verse 3 begins, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. So instantly what stands out in our passage is you filled with the Spirit of God. And this is not some superpower. And the other time that the Spirit of God occurred in the, the Bible before this passage in Exodus is in Genesis 1 where it says, And the Spirit of God, or the Ruach Elohim, which is in Hebrew, uh, hovered over creation. And the other time that the Spirit of God is occurring is in the story of Joseph in Genesis, where Pharaoh, with reference to Joseph, says, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? So with the story of Joseph and with the story here in our passage, both men were gifted with the Holy Spirit for his particular task. Elsewhere, the coming of the Spirit of God upon individuals equips them for a special task. And these happen later as God continues to reveal his redemptive purpose. Note that the verse does not say that God gave Bezalel four things, Holy Spirit, ability, intelligence, and knowledge. No. The filling of the Spirit affected Bezalel to enable him to be wiser, to enable him to be more insightful, more knowledgeable, and more capable of participating in God's work. We're also told that he is equipped in all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, bronze, and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood to work in every craft. And our passage also says that he also gives able men who are to assist Bezalel and Aholiab the ability to work as well. Brothers and sisters, this keeps up with the principle of God confirming his people where the skillful or wise are given wisdom. And this same thing is repeated again in Exodus 35 where Moses says, Bezalel and Aholiab, and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary. In other words, they were given all kinds of gifts concerning the building project. Most importantly, these gifts came from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the Holy Spirit who is the source and giver of all gifts. And looking at this passage, one might say that these men, they had already possessed natural talents. That's why they were in this position in the first place. However, these men were given a, a special assignment, and with that special assignment came special gifts. They alone were called to be part of God's building project. And in order to do this work, they were gifted by the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, this is how the Spirit of God works even today. He gives special gifts to his people, and he gives a variety of gifts. No one else receives special gifts of Bezalel and the Holy Ab, but their example shows us that God will equip us to do whatever he calls us to do. And in the progress of God's revelation at the time, you could say that nobody had ever built a tabernacle before. Nevertheless, God called them to build it. And when he called them, he also equipped them. The same is true for us today. 
who are part of God's church. When God calls us to do something, we should trust that he will equip us to do whatever we need to fulfill it. So this morning, how has God gifted you today? If you haven't discovered what gifts that you have, there's always spiritual inventory tests that you can take. But one of the things that you can do is to serve God where he has planted you. Continue to serve. And also allow others to come alongside of you to confirm some of the gifts that is in you already. And regarding gifts, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians says, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. Every Christian is gifted by God's grace to participate and building up his temple. And there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Some are teachers, some are administrators, some do gifts of mercy, some do gifts of service, gifts of hospitality, and so much more. And so, we must pursue God's calling and use our gifts to participate in God's building project for his glory alone. We must realize that what is required by God is supplied by his spirit. This is what one of our pastors used to say. And also, when God calls us, he is not calling us in vain. He is calling us for a purpose, for his purpose in this world. And so the Lord has certainly given us so much to ponder upon. And reminds us that he calls men and women every day to be his co-laborers as he equips them with gifts to fulfill their calling. So how do we respond to God's initiative? How do we take part in God's plan and purpose for our lives? And my last point is the Lord's calling and equipping requires obedience. And when we come to the last few verses, we get a list of all that went into the tabernacle. These craftsmen were called and equipped to make the tabernacle itself, along with all its furnishings and utensils. Now, what is striking about this list of things that went into the tabernacle is the expression that comes and book, it is book ended by. It says, all that I have commanded you, you should do. In other words, God has specified all parts of the tabernacle and its construction. It is to be done his way and only his way. And if you were to read the preceding chapters, you would find out just how specific God was, was, be, was truly. Now what's left for them to do is to go and carry it out. All they have to do is go and carry what God had commanded them. But we know that as human beings, we are fallen and sinful, and we can choose to obey or disobey God. We often do things according to our own plans and depend on our own resources in ourselves. We become wise in our own eyes and lean on our own understanding. And in the process, we make it about us, and we fail to do what God has commanded us to do. Brothers and sisters, God is perfect and true, and he has set a high standard for everything that he is doing in this world. His work represents who he is, and whatever is done in his name has to be done in his way. Yes, we know that we are not perfect, and that we will make mistakes, but God is a God who is steadfast in his love. He's merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abound in his steadfast love, and he is faithful. And so God's character should humble and encourage us that the sovereign Lord of the universe chooses and uses broken vessels like us to take part in his building project. Thus, every detail in God's work is for the praise of his glory. 
Furthermore, we learned that they needed God's spirit to accomplish this building project. Now, if we were to fast forward to chapter 39, the author tells us, according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the people of Israel had done all the work. And Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. So they had done it. And so, friends, the tabernacle was constructed. It was completed. And they needed God's Spirit in order to fulfill this work. And so we too need God's Spirit to carry out His work. For it is the Spirit of God that will enable us to do every good work as He worked in us and through us for His glory alone. I heard a pastor once say, The gifts of God, when used in obedience to God, brings glory to God. The gifts of God, when used in obedience to God, brings glory to God. And oftentimes, we have our gifts. So how are we using our gifts? Are we using it for God's glory? Are we being obedient to what he has called us to do? If not, we are not doing what God has created us to. We're not bringing him glory. So we need to use our gifts. We need to obey how he has commanded us so that we can bring him the glory that he deserves. Because it is his plan and his purpose. And he has brought us to participate in his work. Now, why does all of this matter? How does all this talking about the building project, the tabernacle, translate to us today? Well, if we go back to the beginning of the message, God intended to dwell among his people. And the tabernacle represented God's presence, which is an important theological theme throughout the Bible. And the tabernacle answered two important questions. How can a sinful people dwell among a holy God? Or how can a sinful man enter the holy place? So the tabernacle shows us the furniture, all of the lampstand, the mercy seat, the altar. It also shows us the process by which God brings sinners to himself. And this should remind us that we cannot approach God on our own. We need his divine accommodation where he meets us where we are on his terms. Thus each part of the tabernacle computes communicated something about him and his relationship with his people. And ultimately, the tabernacle pointed to someone. It pointed to the true presence of God dwelling with us. It pointed to Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John tells us that the word became flesh and he dwelled among us, or he tabernacled among us. So no longer do we need earthly priests or do we need a tabernacle that we can move around. We have Christ. And furthermore, the author of Hebrews makes this point. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. The author also tells us, Christ, the true tabernacle, has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. Brothers and sisters, this morning, Jesus is the true and greater temple. He is the ultimate provision of God, and his ultimate sacrifice is, is the source of our salvation. And only through him can we have direct access to God. In fact, he is the the master builder, the one who fulfilled his mission by calling a people and redeeming them to himself. 1 Peter 3.18 tells us that Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us back to God, He was put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. 
And it is in him that God is building a new dwelling place. For God's spirit dwells in us individually and as believers and corporately as the church. A building made of living stones with Christ as the cornerstone. Brothers and sisters, this is an amazing truth this morning. We, broken vessels like us, we are God's dwelling place. And the Lord is building his church and nothing is going to thwart God's eternal purposes in this world. And the the letter of Ephesians tells us that in the fullness of time, he will unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. But until then, today, he is calling us to be faithful to what he has given us and to work every detail of this building project for the praise of his glory. And when that time comes, and the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, we will hear, behold, the dwelling place is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be their God. And the earth shall be covered with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. This is what we are looking forward to, the day when we as Human beings will dwell in the presence of a holy God. There will no longer be any sin, and we will be with him. Now, many people can remember a time when a parent or grandparent or maybe an older sibling taught them to perform a task around the home. Maybe changing a tire, painting around the house, cooking, baking a cake or bread, gardening, and so on. Of course, when they do this, when they are teaching us to do this, they are probably taking more time to teach us than for them to just do it themselves. But by allowing us to participate, they share themselves with us and allow us to take an important step in maturing. In the same way, the God of the universe has chosen us, his people, to shape his creation, to be the salt and light in this world, and especially to build his church, his building project, enabling us and looking forward to God's ultimate fulfillment of his eternal purposes. So the question is for you this morning, do you see yourself as part of this building project? And if so, how are you using your gifts as his workmanship, to bring glory to his name. For we have one purpose in this life, and that is to surrender to him and watch him use us for his glory alone. For we know that the Lord is indeed building his church, and he has brought us to be a part of it. And all he needs from us is our obedience to what he has called us to. Amen. Please pray with me. Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your your people here today. And we ask, Lord, that you, by your Spirit, we remind us of God, of your plan and purpose for our lives, that you are sovereign, that you call and equip your people for your extraordinary purposes. As a God, we depend on you. We depend on your spirit to enable us, to use us, to shape and mold us so that we can do what you have commanded us to do. And Lord, we thank you that you are indeed in control, that you are working all things together for the good of those you have called to your purpose. And we pray, God, for every individual here this morning, that you have called to yourself, and that you have called for a special purpose in Cayman. So wherever you have called us, God, may we be faithful to what you have called us to. We ask God to be with us, to bless us, 
to help us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. We ask you, God, to be with our children. May we be bold in our faith. May we be witnesses and an example to them so that in the future generations they will continue the work. We ask you, Lord, that you would also, God, help us to see the big picture that you are indeed working towards a, an end, and that end is that one day we will dwell in your presence. And as David said in the Psalms, one thing I desire of the Lord, that would I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the God, Lord forever and ever, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. May that be our greatest desire. We ask all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. We stand for our closing hymn. Pastor Jude um, to do the benediction for us. I just wanted to say on behalf of our church family how 
grateful that we are that you um, came and you shared with us, both um, Ketra and Pastor Jude. Um, we wish you safe travels as you travel back home and also um, God's guidance and blessings as you continue your master's and your ordination journey. Hear the benediction from the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.